I just remember that it was something that I couldn't get out from underneath. It was like, okay, God, you're actually calling me to start a church. As crazy as that sounds, as scary as that sounds, um, you're not calling me just to send my resume out to a bunch of established churches. You're actually putting it on my heart to start a church, which was absolutely crazy. I was really trying to figure it out a day at a time. And so I started meeting with a small group of people. Uh, we got together and started writing down on yellow legal pads in my living room. So what do we need to do to start a church? What would it take? When I, when I tell the story of Two Rivers and, and the opening day back in April of 1999, I talk about that we, we backed in the trailer that morning and we set up the uh, the gym and, you know, had the coffee and donuts and all the things and put the signs out. And I remember very clearly on that morning, we were going to start at 1030, I believe, and about 10 o'clock we had everything set up and we'd done a run through. And I remember standing in the lobby and looking out the window at the parking lot that only had five or six cars on it from the people that had helped set up. And I had this, like, panic moment and I'm not really a panic guy but I literally had a moment of panic where I thought what if absolutely nobody shows up here today and as I remember there actually were about 160 people that showed up on that day and uh, I remember standing in the back of the room uh, when that first song started and there were you know 150 160 people sitting in the room and uh, man just getting all teary-eyed of wow this is this is really happening and and only god could make even that moment happen we were a portable a fully portable church for the first 13 years um, and after 13 years uh, we did start looking around for a building and we actually found this building that we're sitting in right now, 88 Hubble Drive. And I just remember the very first day that we opened up this building and I showed up that morning and instead of having to unload a trailer, I just turned a key in the front door and opened it up and I walked in and it was a church and I was like, thank you God, this is so awesome. You know, we've gone from running under 100 people to over 1,000 people that come through here on every Sunday. And over the course of 25 years, there have been thousands and thousands of people that have walked through the doors of God's church called Two Rivers and heard the story of Jesus. And uh, many of them have been saved and many of them have been baptized. But to be uh, the pastor of this place, the shepherd of this place for 25 years and just to see all the lives that have been changed, all the, the, the marriages that have been put back together, the, the ministry that's been done, the, the places that we've been able to go and help people in other countries, just to, to see all of that and get to be a part of that because at the end of the day, that's what it's about, man. It's about people. It's not about how many people come to your church and how many people know your name and all the stuff that we unfortunately get caught up in church sometimes. It's like, it's the people, man, it's the people. And this place loves people like no other place I've ever been a part of. And I'm so thankful that God didn't give up on me and that, uh, man, that I get to stand up and <laughs> tell other people the beautiful story of Jesus. It's the coolest thing ever. We're so glad that you guys are here with us today. And obviously you can tell we're celebrating the 25th anniversary of God's church called Two Rivers. And I know Ron and Debbie, here's, here's the deal. They don't want any credit today for any of this. And I know that honestly us having up here, them up here like this is already making them both very uncomfortable. And so what we wanted to do today though, is we wanna give honor where honor is due and we wanna tell the story, right? God's word tells us over and over, there's so much power in the testimony of what God has done. And so today we hope that what you walk out of here hearing and seeing is yay God. Yep. Praise God for how his faithfulness and his goodness to his church called yeah. Two Rivers. So that's the story. 
we want to tell today. And so just as we start off, I want to draw your attention. On your seats, there's these little cards. Um, and they just ask you, we'd love for you to fill those out, um, to just share a way that God has impacted your life. A God light, we call them God lights around here, that we want to highlight the things of God. And that would really just be a blessing to all of us just to continue to give glory to God of what he's done. So you can fill those out and we'll tell you what to do with them at the end. But there we go. You guys okay? Oh, yeah. Okay. All right, guys. Take away, Nick. So take us back to 1999 when Sarah and I were only 15 years old, just to uh, throw that yes. out there. Barely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, barely. What was the dynamic of the Cathcart family at that time? So how long have you been married? Tell us a little bit about your boys at that time. What was going on in the Cathcart family? I'm going to let you answer that in a second. I have to say two things. Number one, who was that old guy in the video? I don't even know. I don't even know who that guy was. And, and second of all, um, many of you here don't even know, but this is my wife, Debbie. Yes. Um, so we were, um, we, we got, we were walking out the front door this morning and I said, do you want to ride with me? And she said, yep. And so I put her in the truck and I walked around and I got in and as we're driving, she said, this is the first time we've driven to church together in 25 years, and that's a true story because she's always doing her thing and I'm doing my thing, and a lot of times you don't even see us together on Sunday morning. And I was and, home getting ready yes, for yeah. kids. So, tell, so now tell that part, yes. Um, so we were married 11 years, just had celebrated our 11th wedding anniversary, I guess, when we started Two Rivers. And um, our household was crazy. Um, so we had two six-year-olds, a seven-year-old, and an eight-year-old when we decided that God was calling us to this. And um, is, that, is that it? All, bo all boys, right? Yeah. All, all boys. boys. Yeah. All. So, the, so two six-year-old twins. Yes. Seven -year -old a seven-year-old and an eight-year-old. And if we had time, I'd have you tell me more about that seven-year-old, but we'll get to that later. Yeah. yeah, he's somewhere here with a mullet in the stand. We do so. need to hear their names, though. You need to hear Ron, if you've not yeah. had the privilege. You so it's, um, it's Carson, Cameron, Connor, Cooper, or Carson, Ray, Cameron, Trey, Connor, Jay, Cooper, Clay. She's Deborah K. I'm Ronald Ray, and we're all cray-cray <laughs> is how I say it. So there, there you go. That's, that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Um, I, I do want to say along those lines uh, a, a couple of things. Number one, uh, those of you that are parents, you know how crazy that time in our lives were. And so um, I say it all the time from this stage, but I'll say it here publicly right now. Like, there's no way I could have ever done what I was called to do without this beautiful lady right here Amen. and all that she did and I did. I, I got up, yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I got up every morning and left the house at 6 a.m. to go help load and unload trailers and she was trying to get four boys wrangled and all to church and it was a crazy time of life. Um, and the second thing I wanna say is um, we, we made it through it. And so to those of you parents who are in that stage right now, I just want to say, hang in there. Jesus will get you through this and, and you will survive. And now we have grandkids and it's as good as everybody says. It's a spectacular thing. So hang in there. But yeah, those were crazy days for sure. That's great. Okay. So we got to hear a little bit about it on the video, but want to hear a little more. Like why start a church. What was going on? Give us a little more of the backstory. What was God doing in your guys' lives and what led you to ultimately being like, man, I think it sounds like a good idea to plant a church. Sure. Uh, well, I never set out to plant a church. I, we, we've talked a little bit about this. I, I think we were talking and I, I told you there was one class that I had in seminary. It was a missions class and the professor was talking about church planting and I had never really thought about that or heard of that. Like now there's church plants everywhere, right? But back then, and church planting wasn't cool. But I remember hearing him talk about it, and it just kind of struck a little chord in my heart, but I set it aside. And then quite a few years later, uh, I found myself in a situation, um, and, and I want to say this very respectfully, we came back here 
and I was pastoring a little Baptist church, and um, I just found out that some of my ideas about how to do church and what, I, you know, I told them, I said, I'm willing to do anything short of breaking the law to reach people for Jesus, and they just weren't quite there with me. And I was a young leader too. I mean, as I think back on that, I could have handled some of those situations much better. Um, and, and that story is a part of who I am today and why we're sitting here. But I, I came out of that situation and, uh, you know, normally what you would do if you ended at one place, you'd send your resume out to all these churches. And I remember even in that, I had called some buddies of mine and I was trying to make things happen. And figure out where to go next, and God just kept slamming all the doors, and uh, so the whole idea of, man, what if we just started a church from ground zero, clean slate, and um, I could take some of my crazy ideas about what I think church should look like and how church should be done, and, and we just started there, and so that really just began to resonate in my heart and my mind. Um, I started talking with Debbie about it. Um, and, and you should probably tell this part. Well, I love church. You'll hear me say that more than once up here probably. I just love church. Grew up in church probably from the, the first Sunday I was alive on. And I love it. And, and what church is is God's people together though. And, and I just love that. So anyhow, when he started talking about planting a church, I think my greatest fear was my boys would not have the experience that I had had all my life, and they wouldn't have a youth group to grow up in, or a children's ministry to grow up in, or children's choir was a big thing back then, and it was fun, and all those things were so fun to me, and I just was, uh, I was a little uneasy about it because I was I want this for my kids. What if it's just me and Ron and the kids and, you know, a few other families for the next 20 years, a couple other families, and I'm like, I, I want them to have the experience I had because mine was great. But anyway, as I started praying, God laid it on my heart, and um, I hope that he lays this truth on your heart or already has that it, whatever he has for you, it might look different than what you have in your mind, but if God lays something on your heart, he's going to take care of you every step of the way. So he started changing my heart about planting two rivers. And yeah, so again, just all the years, 25 years of memories as I was thinking. Um, so I remember I started talking to Debbie about this, and I was talking to other people about it, and just honestly, most of the people that I talked to said, you're crazy, why would you do that? There's all kinds of churches out here that you could go pastor, why in the world would you start a church? Like I said, church planting wasn't prevalent, a lot of people thought I was crazy, I think she thought I was crazy, um, but as we were kind of in between trying to figure out what we were do, some of our friends would call and say, so what are you, what are you guys going to do? And I remember one day the phone rang, and by the way, this was so long ago, it was a phone on the wall with a cord on it. <laughs> <laughs> and the phone rang, and she went over and picked it up, and, and I was sitting on the couch, and I couldn't hear the other side of the conversation, but I remember hearing my... <laughs> I remember hearing her start casting this vision into the phone about, hey, I think we're going to start a church, and it's going to be like this, and it's going to be like this, and she did a better job than I could ever do of like casting the vision for what this place was going to be, and I remember sitting on the couch and saying, God, only you could do that, right? Like he brought our hearts together on this because we had to be kind of crazy to do this, quite honestly. <laughs> and and um, um, cause there was, you know, no, no security, didn't know where the next paycheck was coming from. But I remember just listening to her start telling whoever it was on the other end of the phone, here's what God's called us to do. And here's what it's going to look like. And I'll never forget that moment because God 
brought our hearts together, and it was, it was a beautiful moment. So you've mentioned the vision. You mentioned something different than what you had experienced. What, what were some of those things? What was that vision that you were casting that was particularly different than some of your church experience up to that point? I'm sure some of it was the same, but what were some of those different things that you really wanted to implement? Yeah. So I'm probably messing your all's questions up. You're right on track. Yeah. Here we go, right? So, so the, the, the statement for this place from day one has been we exist to help people become passionate followers of Jesus Christ. And uh, th th that's not something I made up, quite honestly. That was just my sentence to say what Jesus told us to do, to go make disciples, right? Preach and teach the gospel, tell the good news of Jesus over and over, and then help people grow in that. And again, I want to say what I'm about to say very respectfully. I'm not bashing on any of my own church experience or any churches I was ever a part of, but as I was, you know, at that time about to turn 40 and it had a lot of church experience, I, I just... Um, I, I wanted there to be a place where people could come and be absolutely real. And I, I've preached it here for 25 years. I preached it just a few weeks ago, right? Like, we're, we're to be humble people of God. We should never get over what God has done in our life. And I've never gotten over the fact that uh, I know who I am. I am a sinner, and I'm a sinner saved by the grace of God. And I say it all the time. God should have crushed me under the weight of my own sin a long time ago. And so I wake up every day and preach the gospel to myself. And, um, but, but I saw a lot of times that people who were maybe not in a good place, having crisis or whatever, they would turn to the place that I would say to everybody, turn to, hey, Come run into the church. Don't run away from the church. Come running to the church and bring your mess, right? We say that around here all the time. We're a bunch of messed up people, and I'm the head mess, and if you're messy, welcome to our mess, right? Like, we say that around here all the time, but that was my heart of, hey, what would it be like if people who really were messed up, me included at the head of the list, if we could come together and be honest about the fact, hey, we're just all a mess, and apart from Jesus, we got nothing, and that we didn't have to come in on Sundays, and I always talk about putting on our church, church mask, our smiley face, and saying, hey, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine, when you're not really fine. And so um, that, that, was, that was my heart, was that I want this place to be a real honest place where people can come and bring your mess on in here, and you don't have to hide it from anybody, and you don't have to worry about being shunned or being afraid. Man, if I really show these people how much of a train wreck I am, they're going to tell me to go away and come back when I get myself cleaned up. It's like, no, come here. Let us tell you about Jesus. And, and that's where the passionate part comes from, right? And like, he didn't want to wear a suit anymore. Yeah, I didn't want to wear a suit. That's for sure. <laughs> That's, that's for sure, man. Yeah, that like, was way deeper that, than I thought your yeah. answer was going to be. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I did not want to wear a shirt and tie and a suit to preach in anymore. And um, <laughs> so, so anyway, I, I, wanted to, I, I wanted to create a place where everyday people like me could come and be honest. Because I'm, I'm just an everyday guy right? Like I was out yesterday cutting my grass like everybody else and taking the trash out and doing all this stuff and I'm a mess and I struggle with all the same things and it's like, let's come here and be honest about that together and then set Jesus right in the center and not just be passionate for an hour on Sunday morning, but that our relationship with Jesus would literally affect our lives Monday through Saturday also and that was the heart of this place, and it's still the heart of this place 25 years later. So that, that had to have played into that vision, the name Two Rivers, right? Like, I know there's a deep spiritual uh, yes. thought yeah. process behind the Two yes. Rivers. Why don't you share that with the yes. rest of the, the church of how yeah. you came up with the name Two Rivers Church? Yeah, so I, I get asked that question often. So we had this small group of people that had been meeting um, in, in a couple of uh, unfinished basements that were right next to each other and did, you know, a worship service in one and kids in the other, but it was getting close to time for us to go public and we still didn't have a name. And we had looked at all these, you know, we talked about, well, you know, St. Charles Community Church, St. Charles Family Church, Winghaven down here, 
wasn't even developed at that time. It was just a big piece of land, but we knew it was coming, and we thought, you know, Winghaven something, nothing stuck. And so one morning, I walked out to my, uh, my mailbox, and I, there was a postcard from a new business in town, and it was called Two Rivers Geriatric. It was some kind of a business for old people. <laughs> um, I probably should see if they're still around because I could use them these I'm days. I was going to say, that's the joke yeah. we say is that now you're yeah. going to need it. <laughs> uh, but when I saw Two Rivers, uh, I thought, that's it, right? Like, we don't know exactly where we're going to land, but we're going to be somewhere here between the two rivers that define St. Charles County. And I don't know, that, again, just struck a chord in my heart immediately. And I went back to our small group of people that were working on starting this place and I gave it to them, and then we actually had a guy who was an art teacher at Florissant Valley Community College, and he went and gave his art class as a project, give us a whole graphics package for a church called Two Rivers. And so they all did, it was actually a class project, and then we picked one that was our original first, you know, uh, logo for Two Rivers. And so I'm sorry that's not very spiritual. Um, <laughs> We've actually tried to make up some spiritual things along the way. Well, it's the Tigris and the Euphrates, then, you know, in the promised land. But no, I got a postcard in the mail that said Two Rivers, and that was it. Yeah. I think that's a way better story given the history of Two Rivers. I feel like that's way more fitting yes. than what, what we yes. needed to have. Okay, I know there, we could sit here for weeks and share story after share story of things that have been defining moments or things that have impacted you all or things that have impacted this community. We call them God lights, how we want to highlight what God is doing so we don't ever lose focus of what's most important. And I know you guys could tell a bazillion stories, but we would love for you guys to share just a few each of just some of the things that kind of stand out that have been important to you or that you've loved about being here at Two Rivers. I'm going to let you start. Okay, <clears throat> never get to preach, so right. here's this my preach. Oh, this is your time. Here you go. Um, Maybe 25 years from now you'll get to do it again, so <laughs> give it your best shot. <laughs> uh, so one of my very favorite verses, and it's, it's kind of a weird verse maybe, but I already told you how much I love church, and, and I want to reemphasize church is not a building, but it's, it's God's people gathered together. So I love church. But Romans 1.11, I believe it's 1.11, says, I long to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual truth to make you strong. And then it goes on to say, that is that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. And I love that because church is meeting together and encouraging each other with our faith. And so my God light is you. <laughs> and, and when I see you and I get to hear your stories, and back in the beginning, I, I was able to know everybody. And I look around and there's so many faces that I probably haven't even met. And even though I haven't met you, I love you. And I love Two Rivers Church. I love you. You're a, if you're in this building, you're family. And um, my God light is seeing Jenny McConaughey that used to be Jenny Mason and I've known her since she was two years old and watch her grow up and serve God and end up marrying somebody that's on staff here and that means she's on staff too <laughs> and and not really but anyway just to worship God and Johnny um Let's see, he, Johnny Moore played ball with my boys when he was like eight or nine years old. He was this little catcher, and he was, he was just the funnest little guy ever, but he ended up at Two Rivers Church, and now he's on the stage giving glory to God, and I'm watching them have kids, and I'm watching them bring them in here. Uh, Nate and Andrea, when I worked back in youth, we're back in youth, and, and Andrea... Andrea's going to get after me. She, I remember being at camp, and she was just so boy crazy. <laughs> 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 and I loved her to death. She's and hiding. She's and hiding. to watch what God has done. It's that whole you and I will be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. So I just, in just a brief minute, to just tell you, get involved with the people of God because your heart will be so encouraged by that. And that's what God wants us to do. And that's, 
Um, so that's, a, that's my biggest God light is just being with you, watching you. You are my God lights. Amen. You have to pick one. Yeah, I, I, have, a, I have a whole list, um, and I'll run through some of them. But I just want to say, that I should, probably should say this here after 25 years. You all do know she writes all my sermons, right? Like you, I, That's probably becoming evident here. Um, so so I, 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 we've been talking for the last couple of days just as we've been reminiscing um, and I, I wrote down some things, uh, you know, I've already talked about the first day, but that was just a godlight to see literally from nothing, just a few people sitting in my living room and writing some notes about what does it take to start a church, to see us in Bryan Middle School the last Sunday of April of 1999, and to see this thing that, that God had put on our hearts begin to come to life, and I've said it on the video, but just standing in the back of the room and just weeping um, with joy to see, uh, having no idea that 25 years later I would be sitting here, I would have bet against that, quite honestly. Uh, I'm not a stay in one place for 25 years guy, but um, here I am, and uh, yeah, I guess I am. And uh, I, I remember just in those early days, uh, some of the the help that we got, uh, there, there was a gentleman named David Hall who was on staff at another church, and that pastor actually sent David um, and, and uh, said, we're going to pay his salary for a year. And I always tell church planters, man, if somebody's breathing and has a pulse, you can use them, right? And so, uh, in, in, especially in the early days, anybody that comes along to help is, is just... And, and God sent him and a, and a gentleman named Gary Gann. Uh, there was another pastor in the area who literally stood up in front of his church and said, let me come on a Wednesday night and speak and told some of his people, you should go be a part of this, which they did. Um, and then we've been able to do that here throughout the years. We've helped, you know, Matthias Lott and other churches and sent some people and sent money and just had a heart for the kingdom, not just this place. Uh, I, I, I have to say, you were talking about people up here on the stage, right? I was standing in the back, and um, I would be remiss if I didn't say one of my God lights um, is almost every Sunday for the last 25 years, there's been a guy right in this corner with a bass guitar in his hand named Bruce Stroh. And every time I see Bruce, um, it, it's a God light. I said this morning to Ron that Bruce has probably been on this stage more times than he has yeah, in the yes, last 25 that's, years. That's true. And so Bruce and I kind of have a pact. It's, he, he always says, when you go, I go. And I'm like, well, when you go, I go. So I don't know how much longer we're going to be around. But I, I just, and, and, and I could tell literally a hundred stories about people like Bruce who have served so faithfully. Karen was up here her husband, Gary, you know, came and helped unload load trailers, and there's nothing fun about that, and so it's exciting for about two weeks, and then it's hard to get people to come, and I think almost every Sunday for 13 years, Gary was there, and Karen singing on our stage, and, and uh, Brian playing the drums, and I remember the first day he showed up, he had this big red mohawk, and I'm like, who's the dude playing drums? That's awesome. And uh, so, so I, I would just, you know, agree that the, the, the people are the ultimate highlight and God likes. Like, it's all about the people. Um, I, I, I do have, I, I want to talk just about a couple other things really quickly. Um, the, like, I was thinking through this, um, this is crazy, but um, uh, we have never in 25 years passed an offering plate at this place. And that was one of the things early on, it was like, how are we going to do this? And I said, build a little box and put it in the back of the room. And they're like, that'll never work. And uh, I, I read the story about Jesus and the widow's might, and it said Jesus positioned himself so that he could watch people walking by, dropping their tithes and offering in the box. And I'm like, there's my verse, build a box. And we put a box in the back of the room. And one of the reasons I wanted to do that is because, again, I know that a lot of people, one of their problems with churches is all they want is my money. And they beg for 
my money and, and um, I wanted to make sure that when people came here that what they're hearing is, we want you to know Jesus. And I'm fully convinced if somebody comes to know Jesus, he'll take care of the generosity part. Here we are 25 years later and, uh, and, and we're still going and it's all a testament to the Lord and to the generosity of his people. But that's always a highlight for me. Um, we've done mission trips all around the world. One, one in particular I wrote down is I just remember we built a church for this pastor named Modesto um, down in Mexico. And so we had been down there all week. And it's 105 degrees every day. We're sweating. Last day we're trying to button up the roof and we had generators because it was out where there's no electricity. Um, we all left around 7 o'clock, went home, showered, ran to a restaurant. We came back at 10 o'clock that night because we were supposed to have a worship service in this community. Yeah. But there was no light out there, so we pull in with our vans, and I thought, oh, great, nobody's come. And uh, I remember, uh, I think it was Ross Warrington went over and pulled the string on the generator and the generator started running, and then the lights fired up, and I was standing at the back door of the church, and when the lights came on, the, the church was literally standing room only, <laughs> filled with people from that community, and then all of us Americans, we didn't even have, we couldn't even get in the building, so we're all standing around the outside of the building looking in the windows, and... Um, it, it, was, it was like literally God saying, hey, pay attention, this is what heaven's going to be like. And so, and I could tell a thousand other mission trip stories, but just being able to be involved in spreading the gospel around the world, and um, man, I, I got a hundred here, but we need to move on, I know. Well, you have to share different ones each service, and then go back and watch it, and you'll see what else he says. Okay, so Ron, we've gotten to spend... Nick and I have had a good amount of time with you. In over 25 years, I don't know if you know this, but you have quite a few what we're going to call Ron-isms, some things that you just say that are re really uniquely yours. So Nick and I would like to share top 10 things we've heard Ron say over 25 years that we may still be trying to figure out what they mean. Yeah, and these start comical and get a little bit more serious. But, uh, and there's so many more. But number 10, they're as lost as a goose in a snowstorm. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> number nine. Keep the cookies on the bottom shelf. I'm a cookies on the bottom shelf guy. Yep. Yeah, I'm thankful for that. Number eight, are you smoking what I'm selling? One of my favorites. <laughs> yeah. Number seven, stop trying to shove 10 pounds of potatoes in a five pound sack. Yeah. I may or may not have heard that one a few times. <laughs> Number me. six, as hot as a cat on a tin roof. <laughs> right? Oh yeah, there we go. Oh, yeah. yeah, that's oh, bad. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> here, here you go, you need to look at the one behind you. Turn around. Yeah, that one we can put go. the bubble on. Number five, there's a fine line between faith and stupidity. Yeah. It's a good one. Number four, you need to listen faster because I'm really preaching now. <laughs> yeah. Number three, no one stands alone. No Lone Ranger Christians. Number two, which this is not an original, he would say that, but uh, something that I think he says quite often, preach the gospel to yourself every day. Yep. And number one, Jesus is the lead story. Yes. And here's the deal. We've watched you guys live that out amazingly, that Jesus is the lead story of both of your lives. And that has seeped in every area of this place. And to watch you guys in 25 years of a church is not easy. And there's a lot of times that it would have been easy to quit or give up or even walk away from the faith. And the fact that you two have stood strong, you've stayed married, which is a testimony in and of itself, um, and you've stayed faithful to God. Are you saying that because you work with one? Yes, I am. <laughs> I am saying that because <laughs> Debbie is a saint for real. I don't know how she does it. But seriously, you guys paved the way in such a humble, amazing way. I got to tell one story. Um, the word that Nick, and Nick's going to share this too, that comes to mind is servant. And we've watched Ron and Debbie in a bazillion ways that no one would ever know. And one of my favorite things is early on, people would be like, is Ron? I'm the same, like on the stage, like off the stage as he is on the stage. And I, I always love that I could say undeniably, yes. Um, he is really, truly one of the most humble, servant hearted people I've known. And Debbie follows right along in that. There was a time we did the barn bash. Debbie leads the way. In Debbie that. does yeah, lead the right. way, and Ron just follows. But we did a barn bash here in this building, um, one event, and there was straw and hay all over the place. And I remember we needed to do this massive cleanup because there was like three or 400 people in this building. And I come over, and in this room is Ron steam cleaning the carpets. 
And that is one story of probably a thousand that Nick and I could share of how we've seen Ron and Debbie model truly being servants and doing whatever is needed, whatever it looks like to make sure people hear the beautiful name story of Jesus. That's good. Servant humble. And then the last word I would use is consistent. Um, so when I was 20, I got uh, saved. My wife rededicated her life. She wasn't even my wife at that time. First church we were ever part of before we were married was Two Rivers Church. And really what captured us very early on to be able to stay there for the last for about seven years before we moved uh, was I remember Debbie roaming the halls very early on and just loving on people, um, getting to know their stories, including mine and my wife's Amy. I remember Ron preaching directly from the word of God, but with grace and transparency and vulnerability, being out on the parking lot over at Timberland High School, greeting people as they came in and leaving. And as I was thinking about that this week, nothing has changed except for the color of his hair over the last 25 years, uh, as far as what they're still doing to this day. So just the consistency is uh, for two that are in ministry, right, to see Uh, on the ground floor, how hard ministry is and can be, and to stay consistent and humble and servant-oriented for that long is, uh, again, it's not all about them, but at the same time, there is something about honoring and respecting your leaders, and these are two of the best. So as we were thinking, how can we bless you guys or honor you? Could we go the sentimental route? Should we go the practical route? And we decided to go the practical route, and we know two of the things, or one of the things you love more than anything else if not the most, is to spend time with your grandchildren. And three of your grandchildren are over in Hawaii, and it's not cheap to fly to Hawaii. Uh, So what we decided to do as a church family is we wanted to get you a Southwest voucher. This is not the real one. And uh, you guys have $5,000 of Southwest voucher (laughs) tickets to be able to go to (laughs) Hawaii. Oh, you bet, man. Thank you. That's awesome. There you go. That's awesome. There you go, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to take that to the airport. Yeah, you can actually go wherever you want. You don't have to go to Hawaii. They don't expire, and really just an opportunity to get away Thank as, you. Uh, you know, you get a little older and have less responsibilities around here and can just go spend your time however you want to spend them. So we love you guys. Thank, Thank you so you much. All. Yes. Thank you all. Well, as we conclude, I think the last, here, I'll slide this right over here. The last thing we want to just kind of share is, Ron, the beautiful part, and you've said it, is the same reason you started Two Rivers is still still going on 25 years later. And so as you look and we look to hopefully many more than another 25 years, hopefully hundreds of years unless Jesus comes back, which will take. But the next 25 years, what would be your biggest hope, prayer for this place going forward? Do I get to stand up now? Yes, you can stand oh, okay, up Okay, good. <laughs> we got to clear the stage. <laughs> so, uh, my, first of all, I did the math. 25 years from now, I'll be 88 years old. Uh, I, w- I will not be the lead pastor here when I'm 88 years old. Um, but if Jesus hasn't come back yet, I'm hoping by God's grace I can come right up on this stage, or at least that they'll wheel me in in my wheelchair and let me sit in the, in, the, in the back to celebrate the next 25 years. And listen, uh, you know, methods change, models change, things change, there's things happening all the time, but here's what doesn't change. Jesus is the lead story. And so even if you walked into this place today and you're like, great, I come and they're celebrating the 25th anniversary and it's not like we normally do things, uh, I I need to tell you this. This This is the only reason that, the only qualification that I have to do what I do is that I am a sinner saved by the grace and the mercy and the love of Jesus that was put fully on display at the cross of Calvary. That's all I got. It's my business card. It's Jesus. It's I've never gotten over what Jesus has done for me. And so what does the next 25 years look like? It looks like a church full of people that have never gotten over what Jesus has done for them. And then they go tell everybody else about it because they can't help it because it's not just a Sunday thing but it's, hey, I'm a passionate follower of Jesus Christ. I am passionately in love with Jesus, not just for an hour on Sunday, but Monday through Saturday. And if you spend much time around me, some Jesus is going to come out. That's what I hope the next 25 years 
looks like. And I hope that 25 years from now, if Jesus hasn't come back and if I'm still around, I hope that we're just telling more and more, another 25 years worth of Jesus stories because that's it. It's all I got. (laughs) I tell people all the time, we're a Jesus church, and if you get tired of hearing about Jesus, you're not going to like it around here because it's Jesus, 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 Jesus. So I'm not casting any big, you know, here's our 10-year vision or 25-year vision. The only vision I have is, hey, would you, me, us, stay firmly focused on Jesus and and that Jesus is the lead story is not just a cliche not just a banner on a website but it is the absolute truth in your life and my life and if you're in this room or watching online um, I'm telling you even on a 25th anniversary celebration If you're not sure where you stand with Jesus, we want to talk to you about that. We want everyone to know Jesus and not just know about him, not just be religious, not just show up at church every once in a while, but to know Jesus passionately. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to ask our staff team, our elders, I'm going to ask some folks just to, I mean, by the way, you should clap for all these people because they have to put up with me all the time. (laughs) 